All right. Hello, Internet. Welcome. Uh, this is Sien. This is Koji. This is Bobby here. And this is Leo. Yeah, welcome to episode two of Crypto in Asia. Uh, today we have a very special guest with us, um, Leo from Hong Kong. And we'll be talking a little bit about um, Hong Kong. Last time we talked about uh, Korea and Japan and about Malaysia, Malaysia, Singapore. But this time we'll be stri stri strictly be focused on Hong Kong and a little bit about CoinGecko and their, uh, uh, their, annual, their quarterly report. So let's take it away. Koji, would you do the honors of oh. asking Leo all the hard questions? Sure. Uh, so actually, Leo is one of my good friends uh, in Bitcoin. And I just invited him because he's, he's been in the space for a long time and you know, been very active in Hong Kong. I actually recently visited Hong Kong myself and met Leo as well. So just thought Leo would make a very good guest. So wanted to ask a lot of questions about Hong Kong, what's happening there and why Leo is in Hong Kong because this show is about Asia. So Leo, could you uh, maybe introduce yourself first? Yeah, very honored to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I moved to Hong Kong in 2011 to study statistics. Um, so I didn't really come to Hong Kong thinking this is a great place for crypto or I want to spend my life in, in Bitcoin, um, but rather um, it offered like a, a very good university. Um, it seemed like an interesting place and I felt like I could to learn something. I didn't expect too much that I would uh, stay, especially not for so long. But um, very quickly after I finished my studies in 2012, um, I realized um, this is an interesting place to work in too. Um, and I quickly found a quite attractive job in uh, data mining and data analytics. Um, and so, yeah, through, also through my other interests um, of information security or online privacy, I um, found people who knew about Bitcoin. Um, and Bitcoin is something I knew nothing about, uh, but something that I found very interesting, simply from the promises it made. It, it promised really to be like, uh, yeah, peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. Um, an anonymous uh, internet, uh, the anonymous currency of the internet. Um, and um, I discovered that in 2012, um, somebody hosted the first uh, Bitcoin meetups. Um, and I uh, wasn't there to join the first meetup, but I was there to organize the second one. Um, and yeah, throughout 2012, 2013, um, Bitcoin was always on the rise and it was always, yeah, I still knew very little about it. I at least for, I bought my first ones. Um, but since then, we've been following what's been happening here. We've been organizing meetups and conferences and talks and uh, job fairs. Um, the, yeah, larger, the way Hong Kong interacts with the um, general like, crypto Asia scene has been Change a lot, changing a lot as well. Um, but it's certainly been exciting enough to get me to commit more and more to Bitcoin um, and to um, commit more and more to Hong Kong. What was your first reaction to Bitcoin? Did you find it kind of suspicious initially though? Because that's kind of the reaction of a lot of people. Um, not so much in suspicion that I thought it was a, was a scam, but more suspicion and, and thought of, does this even work, right? Uh, there would be lots of, lots of systems that people talk about, lots of ideas that are, that they're rather crazy and then they very quickly, um, yeah, disappear into nowhere. Um, so my doubt about Bitcoin was mostly that I didn't understand how it worked. Uh, and I had a hard time imagining that this could really, um, that this could really stay free from intervention, for example. Um, the internet, for example, um, also promised to be an open uh, and inclusive space um, that, yeah, guarantees people, uh, people's anonymity. Uh, but by 2012, we certainly learned that the internet might not necessarily be that thing. Um, and my skepticism towards Bitcoin was mostly focused on that. What was people's reaction? Like in 2012, 13, you know, how the people's reaction to Bitcoin and their attitude toward Bitcoin changed. Because say like in Japan, uh, because Mt. Gox took place in Japan, right? So when I started, the 
public perception of Bitcoin was really, really bad in Japan, right? Because people, my friends would ask me if I was, you know, getting involved in scam or something like that. So I wonder what was, what was, you know, the atmosphere or things um, like in Hong Kong. I think the biggest issue was that nobody had heard of it even. Um, so it was really 2012 was still early enough that, yeah, nobody really knew, not, not, not that people didn't know what Bitcoin is, they've never heard the word Bitcoin. And talking about it seemed, um, it, it seemed like a very, very far-fetched vision, that this thing that nobody's ever heard of, um, that exists only in the depth of the internet, could sometime become like a dominant payment system. Um, and it just, seemed, it just seemed doomed to fail from the beginning, um, because it was very obvious that all the big banks, payment processors, governments, they would all be against us. Um, and so the, it was more difficult to even like strike up a conversation with people. It was not even something that people like actively dismissed. It was just something that people um, just didn't want to talk about, weren't interesting in talking about. Um, I found that all the people who did want to talk about it, they were quite enthusiastic. Um, not so much that they knew exactly how it worked or uh, whether it could succeed, um, but they all agreed this is a great idea. Like, we, should, we should try this out. Um, we should play with this. Um, we should find others who are interested in this. Um, some people are more interested on the side of mining, other more on the side of trading, um, others again about the technology. Um, There's just very, very few people. And the meetup was mostly a place to find others who were more knowledgeable about this than we were, um, which turned out to be really hard. Um, the meetups, um, they weren't so poorly attended, but it was just a couple of, a couple of guys um, asking each other questions that nobody had the answers to. And so these, um, <laughs> we realized that, wait a second, we are the people who have to uh, figure out the answers to the questions themselves. There are, no such, there are no crypto experts, there are no Bitcoin experts. Um, and so we had to, yeah, go back home and, and read up on it and look at the code and uh, play okay. with it. To be able to come back and say, I think this is, this is what's happening here, or I think that's how it works, or I think like this, principle applies cool yeah when you started that early yeah obviously there's no communities to really go and ask right yeah um, is that like only when bitcoin talk forum was available yeah um the bitcoin talk forum was quite helpful um there were a couple of sites um the i think in retrospect it might have been easier to learn about bitcoin back then than it is now um, because there were fewer distractions. There was only Bitcoin. This is the only thing people talked about. Um, there was very, so the, the few people who had interacted with it and who had, yeah, written about it or were confident enough to share their knowledge, they, um, they did so with like a very pure intent. Like most of the blog posts you saw were, were genuinely written with the intent of educating you. And if you Google uh, what's Bitcoin today, you get like dozens of pages of, um, yeah, search engine optimized marketing content um, mm -hmm. that is trying to sell you something else. And um, that makes it actually hard today to, yeah, to read informative articles. I, I actually agree with you uh, <laughs> because if you think about it, uh, Bitcoin in the early days was just uh, layer one. Uh, if you think about it now, if you come into Bitcoin and you're swarm with uh, conversations around lightning network and off-chain solution and all these other distractions for ethereum and all the other cryptocurrencies out there in the market these days yeah yeah, yeah so totally understand <laughs> there are too many distractions nowadays yeah. yeah but at least today we can skip a couple of questions it was very difficult to even explain to how bitcoin works to the effect that people would actively doubt whether it even works um, yeah whether this is even um, whether this can be just shut down tomorrow for example or whether the cryptocurrency or whether the Bitcoin creators can simply print money out of nowhere. Um, we know today that nobody can print Bitcoin out of nowhere. We know today that Bitcoin does work. We know that Bitcoin does withstand um, um, like attacks. Um, and that, um, yeah, it does. Uh, we, can, we can skip straight to the um, what can we do with it part rather than the um, how does this even work part. 
do you ever feel uh, crazy like because you're talking about it and everybody always doubting that this if it actually works and then <laughs> yeah yeah and um, we've been called crazy plenty of times um, <laughs> most absurd jokes uh, the the ability to always go back to it actively use it um, read up on it and just reiterate your um, yeah, you could say belief in it, but more your your convictions um, is is what keeps us sane, really. Um, I think for me, um, there's been plenty of moments where I like hugely doubted whether this can even take off. Um, but somehow, yeah, maybe it's confirmation bias, um, but somehow it's always easy to go back and, and reaffirm myself, yes, this is actually working. Um, this is actually working better than what other systems are out there. Um, and then just thinking back of how much has changed since 2012, I mean, trying to buy anything in 2012 with Bitcoin uh, was incredibly difficult. Um, the, nobody would accept it. There were very few online shops. Like, I think I bought like a VPN subscription with Bitcoin. That worked. That was the first actual thing I bought that felt really exciting. All the other things that I could buy with Bitcoin were, um, it was memorabilia, right? You could buy some stickers or some pins with Bitcoin online. There would be some person like manually putting that into an envelope and sending it to you in Hong Kong. But very far away from, from what you can do with it today. There were no mobile wallets, right? Like, mm -hmm. especially if you I think I got my first like smartphone in like 2013 and there was one app that you could use, like the blockchain.info wallet, yeah. which was then removed from the app store. Um, so then if you, if you had it already installed, you could, you know, um, if you didn't have it, then you people were asking, how do I use this? And we had to be like, well, I'm gonna go back to your computer. <laughs> there's, no, there's no wallet on your phone. Yeah, you brought up a very good point. I mean, I, I just, I completely forgotten there was a time when we used to be really excited that these Bitcoin wallets are all accepted onto the Apple Play Store because it was banned yeah. for a period of time. Yeah. <laughs> so Leo, you, you, you started the Hong Kong Bitcoin Association and you were president for it, uh, of, the, of the association for a while. Do you want to walk us a little bit through how the association came about and some of the things that um, you've done? So there's been, there's been multiple people who had their hands in the association and have been driving it forward. Um, the, I think the, the founding moments were in early 2014. Um, Bitcoin had just, uh, yeah, um, started to crash down from its peak in, in November, December 2013. Um, Bitcoin was for the first time really on, in newspapers. It was for the first time like while they talked about it for the first time came up in, in uh, parliamentary sessions in Hong Kong. Um, and we organized, um, so a friend of mine, um, uh, Jae Han Chu, um, he is uh, yeah, um, a, a co-founder of Kinetic um, today and uh, also the founder of the Hong Kong Ethereum meetups. Um, we decided to do like a, a Bitcoin day, um, meaning he had a, he, he had a, a little cafe um, and we would uh, take over that cafe for, for a day. And we had these different stations, right? We had a, we had a table in the corner where you could trade Bitcoin. Um, so you could just stand by the table, approach others who come to the table and just say, hey, do you want to buy, do you want to sell? And really like very it's like simple peer-to-peer -peer trading. Um, we had a little um, a coffee machine and you could buy sort of uh, vouchers for coffee with Bitcoin. Um, we had a little bar. Um, we had uh, somebody selling um, like Beijing pancakes uh, and we had a little stage um, and that turned out to be like a really, really fun day. Also relatively well, um, yeah, well attended. Um, but we realized, hey, this is, this is real. Like A, Bitcoin really worked um, for like the traders were happy, uh, people who wanted to buy Bitcoins or get rid of Bitcoins or people who wanted to, um, yeah, for the first time um, use Bitcoin to buy something. Um, that all that all worked, even though it was often clunky and even though it often um, yeah it didn't feel very smooth. But we realized there is like an actual community, and there are people who wanted to um, build um, yeah build products on top of it. Um, and so as the as the day progressed, and as um, yeah 
the evening um, it became evening we started to sit around the bar um, we decided that this um, community that's been growing has to become a little bit more formal has to become on a more of a, a formal umbrella and um, the idea of the Bitcoin Association was was formed um, it took um, of course a long while for this association to develop it's not something that like was immediately endowed with like generous uh, funding and uh, could immediately like start with offices and staff. Um, all we had in the beginning was a, was a branding and a group of people who were yeah, dedicated to that cause. Um, and I think from 2014, it took us another um, year and a half until we had agreed on a, on a long lasting um, uh, articles of association, um, a long lasting charter, um, and then it took another year for us to make the decision to formally incorporate. Um, and now we've been, yeah, only properly registered in Hong Kong as a not-for-profit for about one and a half years. Um, in so, yeah, it's 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 a relative. So to, between 2014, it's of course where we can celebrate our fifth anniversary um, um, in next month. Um, but it's not that. Um, it's not that we've been driving at full speed for these for these five years, um, but it's been quite a, a, a continuous uh, development also in figuring out what are we really here for, right? I mean, in a way, a Bitcoin doesn't need an association. Uh, Bitcoin is doing very well without any formal organization. Um, so then who needs this association? What's this association for? Um, what value can we add to the Hong Kong developers and the Hong Kong entrepreneurs and the traders and um, who really is part of that community um, how do we serve them best in a um, in a way that um, yeah it doesn't doesn't corrupt um, the, the industry either um, of course in um, 2014 the Bitcoin Foundation was a, was a big topic and I would say the failure of the Bitcoin Foundation was also something that um, probably very much slowed us down and delayed sort of the establishment or the proper establishment of the Bitcoin Association um, because we were always in fear of us becoming like the Bitcoin Foundation, us taking a lot of money from the community and then just uh, blowing it all away and, um, and, and kind of, yeah, pretending to have legitimacy that we don't have. Well, I don't think many people remember about the Bitcoin Foundation anymore, but <laughs> yeah, they failed miserably, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we are still evolving. Um, so for us, it's been, yeah, one and a half years since we are a properly registered not-for-profit, which means we can more or less undertake a business, which means we can properly receive uh, donations and, uh, and membership fees and uh, sponsorship fees. Um, we can properly yeah, issue invoices for those. We have to pay taxes on uh, any eventual like in, uh, profits that we make, even if we're a not-for-profit, um, there's still taxes. Um, we um, still haven't yeah, quite figured out how the association should in the long run finance itself, for example. Um, that's probably the biggest question and uh, we haven't been able to answer it. Um, in what in what ways do we do we really add like continuous long term value to the um, uh, to the community? Right now, we fund ourselves mostly on a project by project basis, and then these projects might um, require yeah might require labor, might pay salaries, um, but the association itself generally does not. Um, so if we organize a conference. Um, and for that conference, we might hire people or we'd hire, um, yeah, we hire people from our own community to um, work to organize food and to um, do registration, um, to, yeah, just handle the, the, the general admin stuff. Um, but <clears throat> there's, no, there's no continuous position, right? Like the, my position, for example, is entirely a volunteer position. And everybody else who organizes meetups in Hong Kong does so too as a, as a volunteer. So uh, I guess you do a lot of, I mean, the first time I went to Hong Kong, you accommodated me and you just told me about a lot of things about Hong Kong and, you know, introduced me to some people there. Uh, but for most others, what's happening in Hong Kong, 
uh, they, they just don't know much about Hong Kong, right? So uh, from your experience, what are maybe two or three things that people outside Hong Kong should know about the Hong Kong market opportunities and maybe recent uh, re regulation that you're talking about uh, regulation in Hong Kong as well. So can you maybe explain and touch on that topic as well? Yeah, uh, so Hong Kong, I don't think Hong Kong is very difficult to explain. Um, Hong Kong is a relatively simple um, regulatory um, environment um, that pretty much anybody without legal training can explain. Uh, what makes this difficult is that there are some contradictions in there, especially with how we see Hong Kong, uh, with how Hong Kong is portrayed. Um, a lot of the things that you might read about Hong Kong, or Hong, especially especially the cryptocurrency scene, but even generally about Hong Kong, and both the mainstream media and more the specialized outlets uh, might be like at, at best like a gross uh, in, um, misinterpretation of what's happening. Um, and so for, some, for example, some of these contradictions are that theoretically Hong Kong has no um, Bitcoin regulation, um, meaning it's still a very, legally it's a very open place um, where you can still um, legally do a lot of things. Um, like you could today um, advertise yourself as a, as a Bitcoin OTC broker and without requiring any license, um, you could administer like millions and millions of dollars of deals every day. You could do so with cash. And for the most part, you would be able to do so with like very minimal KYC and reporting requirements. Um, the, at, the, at, at the same time, um, Hong, Kong, Hong Kong's banks um, have a very strict no Bitcoin policy. Um, which has make it, which makes it, yeah, close to impossible to really run a functional Bitcoin exchange here. Um, and those are, yeah, those are contradictions, right? Um, and it's not exact. It's very easy for us to explain what the legal situation of Bitcoin is in Hong Kong, but it's difficult for us to explain why do the banks so rigorously reject bank accounts, not just to Bitcoin exchanges, but also to remittance shops and to um, fintech companies, um, to investment uh, funds um, and even to and even to people who just uh, do import export trading or IT consulting like why is it so hard to get a bank account in Hong Kong why is it impossible for anybody uh, touching crypto when these people are not breaking any laws right uh, I think there's also um, in Hong Kong there's a lot of um, like signaling going on the government might um, signal a lot of things or the government might uh, or the government signals might be like hugely misinterpreted. Um, I think the greatest example of that is um, the Securities and Futures Commission, um, sort of a, um, yeah, um, sort of like Hong Kong's SEC. They have issued um, a couple of guidelines, a couple of press releases on security tokens, on ICOs, on cryptocurrency exchanges and cryptocurrency funds. And often these guidelines are relatively yeah, strictly uh, written um, and most of the time they would just, pretty much all of the time, they would just reiterate the status quo and they would just say, hey, you're a security token, um, that means you're a security for obvious reasons and here are the following laws and following licenses that are required for security offerings. And that then gets interpreted as Hong Kong moving closer to regulating security tokens, or Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong uh, plans to give licenses to security token exchanges. Um, I have a question, actually. Uh, basically, there is no regulation about crypto. Is kind of the rule in Hong Kong, but that could attract a lot of scammers, basically, right? And my understanding is that that's what happened to kind of Malaysia as well, because when I visit Malaysia uh, for the first time, there's a lot of scammers, obviously. I mean, it was during, it was in 2017, during the ICO mania, I think. But uh, how does, is it not a concern for the Hong Kong uh, regulator? Or maybe, you know, how does that compare to Malaysia, for example, Bobby? Recently, because there's just way too many scammers or scams in Malaysia, the government decided to basically ban most coins or something like that, right? Yeah, 
I think I think the government's basically putting in, uh, in place regulations and all ICOs are deemed as securities in Malaysia. So I think what they want to do is they just want to uh, scare the scammers away and put in place regulations. So it's not so um, people just think that it's like a no, there's no, there's no law and all, and they're just free to do anything that they want. I think the government, I think it's a good thing, uh, even though, um, I mean, classifying everything as security is not a great thing, of course, uh, but having some sort of regulation put in place, some sort of a legitimacy to the industry. Uh, I think the government's sort of uh, finalizing some, some of these key pieces of regulation. So there's two, two pieces of regulation. One is the regulation of securities exchange uh, on, the, on, the, on the digital currency exchange, and the second one is uh, ICO regulation. So I think in a couple of months' time, it would be interesting to see how things progress. But I think your question is mainly directed at Leo, right? So uh, is there many scams right. in Hong Kong? Right, right. So I was wondering because that, that's what happens usually. And that's one of the reasons uh, Japan, for example, needed to regulate it uh, very quickly, actually, because we just saw too many scams in Japan and people getting scammed. <laughs> Um, so there are different things, right? Um, there are classical pyramid schemes, um, there are classical like Ponzi's, and there are deception um, schemes, um, there are like social engineering attempts to steal people's bitcoins. And all these things are illegal no matter if there's a specific cryptocurrency regulation, right? Like defrauding people um, doesn't matter so much if I defraud you of your, of your cash or of your car or of your bitcoin. Um, the Hong Kong police is in touch with us about this. They are in touch with um, the Hong Kong businesses about this. And um, I can also tell you it's like very low on their list of priorities simply because they see relatively few cases um, compared to yeah, other kind of fraud and deception schemes. So then does that mean that Hong Kong has a general fraud problem? Um, does, does that mean Hong Kong has a general fraud problem that goes beyond um, that of other countries? Um, maybe. I, at least it has that reputation. Um, it seems to be either, I think there is more of an expectation that people are responsible for themselves um, and responsible for their own money. And so in that regard, we don't really see much of a problem here. Um, there, there, there really isn't that much fraud carried out specifically through cryptocurrency schemes. Um, we come across like, at least 10 or 20 London gold trading um, scams for every um, cryptocurrency trading scams, even though they're like fundamentally the same, right? Um, I think the government has also been trying to um, at least, even though they haven't been introducing any regulation, they have certainly been trying to um, create the narrative that Bitcoin is something you shouldn't touch or cryptocurrency is something you shouldn't touch. Um, and that is mainly because the government wants to push any kind of blame away from them, right? If people, if people, come, to, um, if people come to the government and say, well, I invested here in this, in this cryptocurrency uh, trading scam and now my money is gone, I thought this was the future, then the government say, well, we always told you not to touch it. And so maybe um, other countries have like a different problem because governments create legitimacy for, for Bitcoin, for example, or for cryptocurrencies or for blockchain. Um, and then they have to deal with, the, the, with people exploiting that legitimacy. And that's something I think Hong Kong doesn't have. It doesn't give anybody legitimacy. So it also no, um, yeah, no regulator, um, no official feels worried about rejecting that legitimacy again. Um, the other type of fraud is a lot more difficult. Um, I think that's mainly uh, investment um, fraud. Um, and that's very hard to distinguish, right? Like a project that raises $50 million and, and blows it all on expenses um, and declares themselves failed after five years of operation um, is indistinguishable um, from a scam um, that takes $50 million and just, yeah, pushes out press releases for the next five years. Um, well, and so in this case, um, the government is very much concerned. Um, they do, um, yeah, they don't, they don't really actively go after investment schemes, uh, but they're certainly trying to, um, yeah, discourage people from, from investing in this. So I think most of the SFC um, clarifications are not so much new regulation. It's just more clarification that um, if you are a if you're a fund that invests in, in Bitcoin and you have the license to sell to the public, um, then the SFC will probably not let you 
um, hold any cryptocurrency. Um, if you are a fund that sells to institutional investors, then well, it's up to you, right? Um, what you sell to them. Um, and so there's this, um, yeah, this buyer beware clause um, mm -hmm. that kind of excludes everybody from offering investment projects to the public. Um, and in that regard, maybe Hong Kong is like super behind because that's something that is um, yeah, actively discouraged. Um, but at least there is no, yeah, there's no confusion about who gets a license, who doesn't, what are the prerequisites. Um, yeah, I think this, this leads nicely to the next question, which is, so you talked about, it seems like regulation in Hong Kong is all centered towards like uh, trading and in, uh, trading and investing, buying and selling of cryptocurrencies. And so what kind of pe projects and people are involved in the space over in Hong Kong? Is it all dealing with finance because Hong Kong is the finance capital of the world or do you see more variations? And so first to, to clarify, I think the, the regulation um, for Bitcoin, for things like Bitcoin that are classified as virtual commodities, and there is virtually no regulation. And it's very unlikely that there is going to be one anytime in the next two or three years. Um, meaning if you're, if you're buying and selling Bitcoin against cash, you can very freely do so. Uh, if you are um, setting up a cryptocurrency exchange, at least legally, you can very easily do so. But you might have trouble like finding bank accounts. You might have trouble um, yeah, dealing with any kind of um, regulated institution. For example, running an ATM, absolutely no problem. You can just put your ATM wherever they would allow you. But then already putting an ATM into a, into a um, remittance office, right? a licensed institution or a licensed money change or a licensed money lender, um, they would probably highly discourage you from that. Um, the other regulation um, that does exist, right, like generally securities, um, futures, any kind of derivatives, any kind of investment activity or investment advice is regulated in Hong Kong. Um, and it's very strictly regulated. It goes as far as that um, security, like securities trading on an exchange, um, there's pretty much a, a statutory monopoly. Um, there's the Hong Kong exchange, which has a monopoly on trading in securities. And all this applies to cryptocurrencies. Um, and cryptocurrencies that are deemed securities, um, especially like tokens, right? There might be some ICO tokens, there might be STO tokens. Um, you can't offer trading for them. You cannot easily trade them on a platform in Hong Kong. Um, if you want to offer futures, um, you can't easily do that in Hong Kong. So um, Hong Kong is still like a very attractive place for these things. Um, and that's also a contradiction that I think um, people who come here or people who observe Hong Kong um, don't like aren't always like quickly told um, that a lot of the so a lot of in, in the press for example you have a lot of exchanges being quoted as Hong Kong based um, when in fact these exchanges very much prefer not to be called Hong Kong based because their activities um, yeah might be like um, yeah, re regulated activities in Hong Kong. Um, meaning if you offer derivatives or if you offer futures or if you trade security tokens, um, then you aren't allowed to operate from Hong Kong or advertising to Hong Kong. Um, and legally, I don't think any of these exchanges are breaking the law, um, but the narrative is certainly contradicting with, their, with the narratives that these exchanges would prefer. Um, so the, the, the usual legal setup is that you have an exchange set up somewhere in the Caribbean um, you have been ex or somewhere in the Indian Ocean on some yeah, small territory or, or state um, that is operating from there um, from a legal perspective is incorporated there um, and all you have in Hong Kong is some yeah is some t coding activity maybe some um, some PR activity some business development activity and None of this is allowed to happen in Hong Kong to the public. Um, this is all, this is perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine for a, um, for a security token exchange to come to Hong Kong and talk to clients and sign contracts. Um, but they aren't allowed to operate from here and they aren't allowed to like advertise their, their services here to the public. Um, and the irony is now that a lot of the funds, meaning a lot of the customers and a lot of the traders um, are set up in a very similar fashion. Um, so you have an exchange that is um, based in the BVI, 
um, dealing with a fund that is based in Seychelles and a trader that is based in the BBI, but they all have like, they, they all meet in Hong Kong and they all have their offices in Hong Kong and they're formally not operating from here. They're just, they just happen to be here. Um, and I think that's a bit of a, a bit of a contradiction um, because you have, you have a lot of activity that's formally not happening here. Um, that's not taxed here. That's not regulated here. Um, but the people might be here. And um, so far, we're quite confident that the Hong Kong government um, kind of, yeah, respects these, these legal arrangements. Um, at least they do. This is not something that the cryptocurrency community came up with. This is something they copied from the big banks and from the big funds and from the big trading houses, um, which are also often not operated here, which are also often not formally registered here. They just happen to have a desk here. They just happen to have sales staff here. Um, and the, yeah, um, Hong Kong is relatively, um, yeah, favorable in that, in that it, it, it tends to respect these uh, arrangements, um, which is very different from, especially the United States, um, which uh, is known to not respect these um, arrangements. Um, so if you're operating a, a, um, if you're, if, if you're operating a cryptocurrency exchange in, um, yeah, in the BBI, and you have customers in the US or you have sales staff in the US, um, then the US will not let you get away with saying you're not a US exchange. They will treat you like, as if they were a US exchange. And Hong Kong does not. Um, this is what yeah, makes Hong Kong, I think this, this is the part that makes Hong Kong a bit like an offshore jurisdiction, um, while at the same time being like a, a lively and functional city. Um, that is convenient to travel to and easy to do um, business in simply because of the, yeah, there are, there are, so there are well-educated people here um, willing to work for competitive, uh, competitive salaries. Um, there's a, a very well-functioning, um, yeah, corporate services industry, uh, and you might not find that in, in the BBI or in the Seychelles or on a cruise ship, even though you might as well operate your exchange from there. So aside from maybe regulation and exchanges, is there any like interesting trends in Hong Kong nowadays? For example, so I, I think this might be a question for CN as well, but uh, say Cosmos is very popular in uh, Korea now. Is that true? At least that's what yeah. I heard. Yeah, Cosmos is popular and we have a, like a pretty strong ecosystem out here in Korea. Any reason why? Because the what the founder, what's his name? He's a Korean American and he comes to Korea all the time, right? Yeah, Jay was. Jay Kwan. I think Jay, yeah. yeah, Jay Kwan. I think there's an affinity there. But also another thing was Cosmos was. So when I started my YouTube channel, so this is like March of 2017, March and April of 2017 was when Cosmos did their ICO. It was actually an IO because they did it through. Coin one, one of the exchanges out here. So that kind of signaled the beginning of the bull run. And so that's like why all the people that got onto Cosmos at that time, I have to understand are like people, early adopters who had a lot of money and then they poured it, obviously they poured it all into this thing right before the price started shooting up. So it, I think it gets a lot of attention from that. And then all the people, all the different ecosystem people, they are doing, they've, did, they've done a pretty good job that um, unlike other projects which are building their ecosystem out one by one, they actually had a pretty long time to build all the different parts out. Yeah, for Leo, uh, to simplify the question, what coins are popular in Hong Kong? It's kind of a stupid question, but <laughs> you know, what, what community has more presence? And you know, say, for example, I, I get asked a lot about why Ripple is popular in Japan all the time. Wherever I go, people ask me, why Japan has so many, so much trading volume of XRP, and I have to explain it every time. But what about in Hong Kong? Which community has, um, yeah, presence? I would say it's really mainly Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, the and this is also because these are very naturally, yeah, and naturally occurring communities, right? These are organically grown. These aren't so much like directed or stirred. Um, so now, why are why is Ripple not actively advertising here? Why is EOS not actively advertising here? Oh, EOS not advertised in Hong Kong. So uh, yeah, maybe right. 
um, what about IOHK, right? Like uh, Cardano. Uh, why aren't they like actively advertising Hong Kong? And I think a lot of this has to do with Hong Kong not being like a very large and very attractive market. Um, being meaning like only seven million inhabitants. Um, there aren't like I mean, there's a lot of money in the city, but there's, there aren't. Um, yeah, there aren't that many like retail investors to really market to compared to other places, especially when the Hong Kong regulators are probably relatively um, probably relatively competent and relatively good at enforcing their existing laws at um, yeah, in such a small and, and, and close knit city community. And so then if you are at risk of violating um, securities law, um, you're probably not gonna do that in Hong Kong, um, especially if that's where your assets are, and especially if you are using Hong Kong yourself a bit as like your safe space, right? Like this is like for a lot of these, for a lot of the, for a lot of the funds, for a lot of the Chinese funds, for a lot of the Chinese exchanges, um, for a lot of these, yeah, large um, ICO offerings. Um, Hong Kong is a bit the, yeah, the legal, the legal home turf, um, and the safe space that they, that they, that they found for themselves, and they're not gonna mess too much with that. Um, so then, usually the, I mean, this is also relates to the big scams. Um, the big scams that we've seen advertising themselves as Hong Kong businesses or Hong Kong um, yeah, exchanges, for example, like are often targeting other people, right? So we then we come across like a big scam exchange um, that pretends to be in Hong Kong, or we come across a big scam coin that pretends to be in Hong Kong. Um, and that's usually because they're they're not advertising to Hong Kongers. Um, they're advertising like in, in India there's a very large um, a very large Ponzi scheme currently being like, investigated. The founder has been jailed. Um, they were running themselves pr as a Hong Kong institution, and we've never heard of them. Um, but in India, they've always been advertising themselves as being based in Hong Kong. And so we hear of these schemes often only when people come to us and complain and say, hey, this exchange, I've been investing my money there, and now they're gone. Um, what do you know about this exchange? And we've never heard of them. I don't know if that answers your question, but um, the yeah, I don't think it's a very um, like the kind of fundraising that happens here, um, the kind of more questionable events are targeted not at Hong Kongers. They're targeted at um, they're, like you might have Malaysian investors flown in, right, or Vietnamese investors or mainland Chinese investors. Um, and then, of course, the organizers are piggybacking a little bit on like, Hong Kong's reputation as a financial hub and maybe even Hong Kong's reputation as a, as a cryptocurrency hub. Um, but they're quite carefully trying not to raise attention in Hong Kong, either neither from the regulators nor from the community. So I just, just this, is, this could be a simple question. Um, would another reason be, because I didn't hear about like, you know, a lot of like technical talent coming out from Hong Kong. I mean, there's like, like, I know it's rich with financial ta talent from the finance industry, but how's, how's that end? Um, so there is a lot of talent in the city, um, especially people with um, expertise in fund management, in trading, in uh, building um, trading platforms. Um, contrary to, to belief, I think there's also a lot of uh, technical talent in the city. Um, it's just a little bit more hidden and uh, people, yeah, people are just more consciously come here to, um, to really make money and then and, and leave again. Um, the cryptocurrency industry has been quite aggressively hiring, especially around 2017, 2013, from this talent pool of, um, of established banks. Um, I think it's become relatively easy for them to um, to convince people to move away from it because obviously we're all we're all uh, big on FOMO, right? We all think this is the future and we don't want to miss out on it. Um, but also, um, yeah, the banks haven't been like doing very well over the last like half a decade. Um, they had to uh, cut benefits, they had to cut uh, costs, and they had to move out of their like fancy offices and uh, put be people into. Um, into far away, hard to reach um, locations. 
um, and they had to put this corset around people where lawyers are involved in every little decision. And I think, and even though regulation is like slowly encroaching Bitcoin companies and exchanges, um, they are still relatively attractive places to work at um, because for, for once they function more like the commodity markets where sort of anything goes, um, partly because there is no like, um, there is no like code of conduct in the same way. Um, this, the budget for, for parties is still huge. Um, and it just feels a lot more like the, the wild days of investment banking that drew a lot of people to banking in the first place. Uh, and that now draws people to cryptocurrency. Yeah, true. Uh, my, that's kind of my impression as well. Uh, meeting some people in Hong Kong. I mean, obviously not too many people, but, uh, I say uh, I attended uh, Lightning Hack Day, Hong Kong, Hong Kong's Lightning Hackathon, basically uh, Leo organized, and the number of people attending were not too many, but the quality of talent there was pretty high, I would say. So the understanding, the level of understanding was very high. Uh, so I think it's kind of different from how things are in Japan. Like more people are involved now in the space in Japan, but I, I feel like the level of understanding is actually getting lower and lower. Uh, anyway. And I would certainly, yeah. I would certainly recommend people to move to Hong Kong, right? I think it's just a, a business decision that has to be done very carefully um, because we can't just say, oh, this famous derivatives exchange is based in Hong Kong. Therefore, my soon to be famous derivatives exchange will also be um, doing well in Hong Kong. Um, but um, Hong Kong will probably um, be more attractive for other reasons, right? Um, and that does have a very low tax rate. Um, the police, like, we, have had, we have had no single arrest of a Bitcoin trader um, since Bitcoin pretty much came out. Um, wow. So the, the government is very, very hands off. Um, you will have to very actively like scam people to be able to um, get in trouble. Um, but you also have to respect a couple of rules. Um, for example, like not um, if you're running a if you're running a, 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 an activity, if you're engaging in some kind of activity that is regulated, um, you will have to do so um, uh, under the radar, and you will have to do so in a way that um, yeah, kind of creates the narrative that, that you're not here. You're welcome to, to do your business here, um, but you aren't welcome to, um, yeah, openly flaunt securities laws. But, and that's true for no matter if, if, if it's an exchange or a fund, um, I think the only ones that are really exempt for this are, are very are pure software products, um, which, yeah, so then Hong Kong's visa regime might also be, be attractive. Like I think the, there is a lot of technical talent in Hong Kong. Um, they are, they do expect to be paid like a global market rate, which people might seem, which might feel very high, especially compared with, um, yeah, neighboring nations and territories. Um, but it is a, a very high quality of, of talent. Um, and it is very easy to like grow an international team here. Um, because for example, for visas, um, it's a very simple application process and anybody paid more than like 4,000 US dollars a month will pretty much um, uh, be immediately granted a visa, right? Um, oh, really? There aren't too many questions asked. Um, I mean, of course, having, having some kind of employment history or having some kind of ed formal education helps. Um, mainly the government just, if you're, if you're becoming a net taxpayer in the city, then you're welcome to, to move here. And um, I think that distinguishes Hong Kong a lot from many other places. Like the reason why the United States and Europe are still very attractive places because for Bitcoin companies is because it's relatively easy to hire from a large talent pool. Um, so in that talent pool in the United States, right? So you might have a population of 350 million uh, of which a very a relatively large population is going to be highly educated. Um, in Europe, you have 500 million people um, who are probably an average, like not as well educated, um, but if and in China you have even you have even more people, right? Um, but if you're if you're building a company in a in a population in a country with only twenty or fifty million people, um, then you will then to convince you to really being able to hire from a large pool, um, you will need to have like a very open visa regime. And Hong Kong with only seven million people, um, there isn't really the expectation that you're going to be able to 
build a build a global company um, with only yeah from that very narrow pool. And so Hong Kong does provide one of the yeah most open visa regimes that I'm aware of to make up for it. Far more open than than Singapore would be. Um, far more open than. Um, than uh, than places in the Middle East or um, or what are the other good examples South America. Hmm. Well, we didn't really talk about mainland China at all and its relationship to Hong Kong, but it's probably a long, long story. So I guess uh, Bob, Bob, we can move on to the CoinGecko's report and yeah, explain about the market overview. And may maybe if we, we have any questions about Leo, we can still ask. But uh, Bobby, can you do you need to yeah, do sure. share? Let me let me share a screen. Okay. Okay, you can see the screen right now. Okay. Yep. So basically a uh, um couple of, um yesterday, yesterday we published our CoinGecko crypto report. So it's a quarter one report. Uh, we went through some of the overview of the market from January to March. Uh, it's going to go through really quickly. If you are interested to see the full report, it's a 48 page report that you can get on coingecko.com. So uh, some of the things that happened, uh, I think it's been a relatively quiet and boring quarter one, I would say. Uh, very stable, not much price volatility. Uh, there was pro some price increases. Uh, if you look at the uh, overall market cap, network cap, uh, it went up about 16% in quarter one. Of course, this was before um, the huge, uh, the recent bump in Bitcoin price. Uh, I think it happened sometime at the start of April. So you look at the top five points um, for, for 2019. The first three months, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum has been pretty stable at up around 8 to 11%. Uh, XRP went down 11%. But the big gainers was actually EOS and Litecoin. Litecoin went down 103%. Uh, I think it's got to do something with Litecoin halving happening in August. So I guess a bunch of people are accumulating and all. But let's see how. Uh, from the, the, the um, dominance point of view, um, the big one is still Bitcoin. Uh, it doesn't really gain much in 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 quarter one. Um, everything else pretty much maintained the same as it was. Oh yeah, Le Look Leo. Uh, I have a question for Leo. We last time episode one, we asked each other, uh, "Did we hit the bottom yet?" So I have to ask you as well. Did we? <laughs> you think? <laughs> you think we hit the bottom officially? Bye after, bye. after the April spike or? I think quite likely, and if not, then the, the bottom is not going to be far from. So I do think we have reached the bottom, but there might be another like uh, short term bottom um, before we go back to on the way to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for your opinion. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, so yeah, and then, yeah. Uh, this slide just shows that a bunch of uh, coins that came in. I think the big movers for quarter one was actually the exchange tokens such as BNB and OKB. So I think BNB entered the top 10 coin uh, in terms of market cap and uh, OKB gained quite a lot of, of places as well. I think, I think for this report, we did uh, overview. So we did some teams. In, in January, we saw there was a huge, uh, there was a lot of interest in the Mimber Wimber coins. So there was a lot of, um, interest happening in green and beam. Uh, why is popular is basically a new privacy protocol. Um, and, and this actually was developed for a couple of years. So there was tweets from early, like two years ago from 2017, like Charlie Lee talking about Mimbo Wimbo. And uh, there's two different approaches, um, beam and green. And a lot of people were really interested in green. So uh, I think I remember seeing the price. It was so, because of the way the supply goes up in the market, uh, the price was, when it started trading, it was started at a very high price, but it started going down all the way after that. So we just like, yeah, there's all this uh, information on, on uh, privacy coin. And then February, we saw a lot of interest in initial exchange offering IEOs. So I think Binance Launchpad pretty much kick off the entire IEO right. frenzy uh, in February. Um, How but is I think- different from ICOs? <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> It's the same, I guess, but it's just, it's a lot easier from the issuer. You don't really have to right. have, have to oh, yeah, do have KYC, a, right? Yeah, right? yeah, table yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah we did IEO versus I, ICO difference. So the, the, basically the I, ICO, the issuer, token issuer, basically tap on the exchange uh, marketing 
all the exchanges users they have already been KYC to get their list get their to get them to buy the tokens and then um, I think there was a lot of interest. Uh, there was three ex I IEOs happening on Binance Launchpad in quarter one, which was BitTorrent, Fetch, and Seller. But I think I think this IEO thing will not last very long. Um, I think it will. It, it's just a matter of time before uh, everyone realizes that this is like a because it's quite a no-brainer. Like when BitTorrent came out. Uh, from the IEO price to the peak price, it was a 9x return on investment. So everybody saw, okay, if I'm lucky enough to buy in, I get a lot of money. So everybody started trying to get their luck in. And then Fetch.ai went in and they did 4.4x. And then everybody saw the same thing happening again. And then they tried to buy in again. And then Seller did the same thing and they got 3.3x. So one thing you see is that it all gets sold out in like within seconds or one minute or two minutes. But then the ROI starts going down, and then the quality yeah. of project starts going down. So I think it's just a matter of time before everything goes away. Yeah, um, I don't. I don't know if you've seen the videos, but there's videos floating around on Twitter of uh, internet cafes in China, where people are like the whole internet cafe, everybody in the internet cafe during the time of the IEO, all the screens <laughs> are on Binance Launchpad. I'm not even joking. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then they. Everybody clicks the button at the same time, and then some people are yelling "enjoy," and other people are not yelling so much. And then uh, other videos of um, people who are like street workers, they get out their little laptop and they're trying to get into the IEO. So like, it must be a really hot thing. Yeah, uh, I, I think I think that happened a lot in Vietnam as well. I think I, I think Vietnam. the video that I saw was Vietnamese, and it's a bunch of guys in cafe and they're like shouting really happily that they got into this uh, lottery. <laughs> Yeah. Yay! Right. We're back in 2017. Awesome. <laughs> FOMO, FOMO. <laughs> um, yeah. And then after Binance did the BitTorrent IEO, all the other exchanges got FOMO, oh, and then they okay. do their own IEOs as well. So we have 4B Pro, Coin Spotlight, Bitrex. Bitrex was very interesting actually. So if you remember, like Bitrex did a big boo boo. They they uh, they did their rate token had their IEO, but they had to cancel because uh, I think there were some questionable characters behind the rate token team. And then they had they had to abandon that, and then finally they get the first IEO very block. Um, and and then March was this Cosmos, so Cosmos was this uh, it's a new blockchain that wants to solve blockchain interoperability and scalability. So so yeah, I think I was gonna ask like uh uh see you and like how how popular is Cosmos in Korea? But I think Koji asked a lot just now. So yeah, yeah, it just. You know, it's if you held on to those atoms, I mean, J J Quan delivered. That's all I can say. <laughs> Leo, Leo, uh, outside Bitcoin, are you looking into or paying attention to any other crypto yourself? Um, and I certainly try to uh, to find the free time to um, to look at other things as well. If I go, if I can go to a fun event, uh, proposing some crazy new governance mechanisms, I will go. Um, but I am uh, I'm very pessimistic about uh, about pr pretty much all of them. All of governance tokens mechanism. Yeah. I mean, oh yeah. I, I think I, I, I'm trying to yeah. replicate like Ethereum success mainly yeah. um, with more and more of the same ideas. Yeah, I hundred percent agree. <laughs> it's not even it's not even Bitcoin that's the contender here, right? Um, and nobody's been nobody's been proposing a better Bitcoin in a long while. Um, like probably 2014, 2015, we saw the last pro last projects coming out. Um, we generally wanted to make internet money like better than Bitcoin. Um, maybe if you count Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin SV, sure. But pretty much all of these platforms that have been launching in the last year um, or 18 months have been Ethereum contenders. Um, but right. Without, without like explaining to us really um, why is it that if they believe Ethereum failed um, and then how are going to, they going to fix that? Right? Maybe everyone's given up on trying to build a Bitcoin contender because no, one's really, no one can really beat a Bitcoin hashing power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Bitcoin very much won that, right? Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's clear yet that Bitcoin won, um, like Bitcoin won in general. Like, I don't know if Bitcoin is going to be like hugely successful. I believe it, but um, I don't really have any proof for it. But we do have proof that like if somebody's going to succeed at creating like magic internet money, then it's going to be Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Well, what's your thoughts about Lightning Network? Do you manage to get the torch that was passed around in, in quarter one? No, I was not a torch holder, um, but I'm a very proud like uh, Lightning user um, who 
Yeah, it runs a couple of nodes, uh, plays around with them a lot. Um, it works. I think it works better than, than Bitcoin did when I started using it for the first time. Um, there's certainly a lot more that I can do with Lightning um, now that Lightning is a bit over a year old um, than I could do with Bitcoin uh, when Bitcoin was already three years old. Then. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of problems still to solve, right? And a lot of question marks. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of uh, questions still to be answered. Um, but from, from how we observe it, it, it works really well. Um, and it's making huge progress um, every month. Yeah, but I think, I, 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 so CoinGecko received the, the torch uh, sometime in February, I think. Uh, so when I, when I got a torch, like I, I got a message uh, from the, the RSK guys, actually. They, they run the La Bitcoinita, the Bitcoin bus in Argentina. Uh, across they went they went all across South America, so they wanted to top, pass a torch to us. Uh, and then uh, I had a lightning wallet running, but I didn't have the capacity to receive that much uh, that the torch. I think when I received it, it was about hundred USD worth, mm -hmm. um, hundred forty or so. I I can't remember exactly, but um, the the point was um, let me see if I write it. Oh, 137. I did mention it. 137 dollars worth. So, but. Uh, so I had to set up a wallet and uh, set up the open a new channel and then had to create the capacity before I can receive the torch. Uh, that took some time, a few right. hours when you set it up. Yeah, there's a lot of issues definitely. Which wallet did you use, by the way? Uh, Bitcoin Lightning Wallet, BLW, ah, okay. on, Android. on Android. But actually, I, I was trying to teach like other people how to use Lightning Wallet, uh, Lightning. But I, I guess like, which is the, I, I found a few wallet but i still think that it's still pretty hard to get started as a beginner on the for lightning network like which yep. wallet would you recommend for beginners oh that's a very difficult question actually and there's one I thing i want to say lightning wallet is great um i also think like uh, zap is pretty cool on desktop mm -hmm. um on ios the the mainnet is not out yet but on ios you can also already try like a testnet wallet um you can also connect zap to your own wallet i I do agree um, that there's, especially around channel management, around liquidity, um, there's a lot that we yet have to learn. Um, there's a lot yet where, um, yeah, the like usability like hugely lacks. Um, at the same time, like using Bitcoin in 2013 or even 2014 was a huge mess. Yeah. Um, and there wasn't anything you could do with it. And the um, I would more compare like the ability to like manage lightning liquidity to be similar to the ability to buy and sell Bitcoin in 2014. Mm -hmm. um, like sure you could, you could solve it by going to Mt. Gox in 2013, which didn't like solve anything in the long run. Um, because in most places in the world, you couldn't get, you couldn't get Bitcoin with cash. Um, and same right now, like we, we haven't really figured out how, how uh, lightning like channel liquidity works if you're if you know what you're doing it seems like a trivial job um, but we haven't found a way to yeah automate that or put a slick ui around it yeah so, I, i've seen i've seen have you tried tipping me it's like a twitter it's like um, a light yeah. web, web client i think that was pretty that's very very user friendly well yeah. but that's custodial right so, yeah custodial so there's someone criticizing Lightning Network Torch experiment because uh, if you use custodial wallet and send it to a custodial other custodial wallet user, the Torch is actually, you know, it's it's not continued, right? You're yeah. not using Lightning Network technically, so some, yeah. someone was kind of criticizing it, and I, I think it kind of famous level level three technology, right? <laughs> like, uh, so that yeah, that's kind of makes sense as well. So there's a lot of issues. Uh, in terms of usability yeah. for but i think i think it's like all these issues we we know how to solve them um we just it just takes a while to code them up and it takes yeah. a while to code them up in a way that's safe um for example in this case um if somebody has the lightning torch they clearly have like here the 130 dollars in their in their wallet um and if you want to receive that torch like there, it should it's relatively it's relatively easy to conceive a method in which some kind of yeah channel gets opened and closed, um, and that's how the liquidity then moves into the channel where where this is needed. Um, it's just that right now this is all done manually, 
and, uh, and that makes it very annoying. But I believe in the future, it will be relatively easy to port on people. Like all, all that we need to tell somebody is um, download this wallet. And right. then they will download a Lightning wallet. And I will, even if they've never used Bitcoin before, I will just need to connect with them. Hopefully, hopefully not um, um, via QR code, but maybe via Bluetooth or via NFC or Wi-Fi. I will make a connection to their, to their phone. Um, and my wallet will immediately know like who to who to open a channel with or who to direct um, to open a channel with so that the first Satoshi they receive or the first Bitcoin they receive um, is done in like a very efficient way with like a maximum of one on-chain transactions. And I think that's very similar to, um, to how we're using Bitcoin today is that somebody has, if you want to film Bitcoin, somebody has to make it on-chain transaction to you um, with the difference is that once these people are um, in the lightning network all future transactions can happen instantaneously and at no cost um, so if you if your first experiment with the if your first um, point of contact with the Bitcoin network is to go to a Bitcoin ATM then in the status quo um, the ATM will have to make an on-chain transaction to to send you that money and that's relatively simple and just takes like 10 minutes or an hour. Um, if in the future, if you have a sort of a, an unused empty lightning wallet and you show that to an ATM, the ATM will have to make a decision on um, how does it open a channel with you? Does it open the channel with you directly or does it um, um, open the channel with you through somebody else? Um, and it will have to make the decision on whether to take on-chain funds and bind them up in that channel, or whether to re-divert funds from another channel and put that into this channel. Um, and then it will have to make the decision of how many funds um, to put into that channel. Um, but I think all these questions uh, should be relatively easy to answer um, for a computer once we have a bit of experience with how the Lightning Network works. And the first time you go to the ATM, it might take an hour, right, for you to receive your, for you to receive your Bitcoin. It might even take three hours. Um, but that first purchase you make is also your onboarding mechanism into the Lightning Network. And in every future purchase you make, maybe through the same ATM, maybe through a different ATM, maybe through an exchange, um, is going to be instantaneous. Um, and we're all going to run around with a couple of channels um, that pretty much um, yeah, define like our receiving capabilities and our spending capabilities. And we're all going to move inside of that inside of that channel capacity and we might and this, this this is going to work even if we even if we think of lightning to be as far as you receiving your um your salary through lightning right your employer opens a channel with you um puts in the salary plus maybe a little bit of float on top of it and over the course of the month you're going to spend um that money by emptying out that same channel and the next month it fills up again and only if you have like long-term savings, um, you will put these onto a, into a paper wallet somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be very interesting, but I think, I think at the moment, lightning couldn't handle that much capacity as so you can only handle, I think 150, $200 or something like that, something less than 200 USD. Yeah, but it's, it's defined, in, <laughs> defined in Bitcoin, right? And so first of all, this is a, this is a, this is an artificial limit, right? Yeah. Somebody, right. somebody coded an artificial Bitcoin limit to just say, please don't, Please don't put more Bitcoin into this because it's kind of reckless of you to do so. This is still better software. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, um, so we, you and I, right? We don't even need. We don't have a. We don't have the same consensus problems as with Bitcoin. We don't need to convince the entire Lightning Network to uh, increase that limit. Just you and I could increase that limit, and then already you and I could um, start sending more Bitcoin through our channel. Um, but also, this is a this this limit is coded in Bitcoin and. Um, if Bitcoin wants to be just moderately successful, it needs to go up like at least 10x in value. Um, meaning this, um, this limit that the Lightning Network now artificially imposes on itself um, is also going to go up like 10x mm -hmm. in value. Yeah, but I think this experiment was useful that people kind of, you know, get their hands on Lightning and like understand its current limitations and how we can mitigate them and stuff like that. So, yeah, I generally agree with Leo that I, I see... A lot for most of the issues, there are already solutions being worked on. So I'm not too worried about the current capacity issue or usability issue myself as well. Yeah. 
I'm just very excited about Lightning because finally, right. after many years, five years plus, like we can actually buy our coffee using Bitcoin <laughs> and get it accepted instantaneously. Actually, <laughs> we don't, I, we don't actually, have to wait for one, two, three confirmations. <laughs> yeah, we need coffee and stickers, right? Right, there's one thing I, I want to brag about. I might be one of the few people who bought a cup of coffee with Lightning. Uh, I was visiting uh, Power Auto at the time and then like i saw a tweet from alex alex what's his last name i forgot alex from lightning labs and he said oh i just onboarded the first uh, coffee shop that accepts lightning network and i go oh, i was there you know nearby so I'm like, oh, that's cool I, I gotta go there and i actually bought a <laughs> cup of coffee with my eclair wallet so yeah that was pretty cool i actually bought a coffee with lightning so yeah nice i was probably a second person after alex himself so <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, we now have, we now have a, a Thai bar and a craft beer bar that accept lightning. Uh, it works quite well. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Anyways, uh, so I guess enough so, about lightning. Yep. So, yep. Uh, actually, <laughs> we're just too passionate uh, about it, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, actually, that, that was pretty much the summary of the report. I mean, after this, there was a section on decentralized apps by Depp.com. I uh, basically went through some... Uh, stats on the on the different blockchains so number of new users uh, I, I think it's pretty interesting because if you look at uh, blockchains you would think that ethereum has the largest user base but if you look at the on-chain transactions and all you see that tron has like 300,000 users compared to 186,000 users on ethereum uh, they have like 91 million transactions compared to 5 million transactions which makes you wonder like what are these guys at Tron doing? Are they like putting on bots and how to make so their devs? Silly it's, games or gambling apps, right? I'm it's like sure. it's like a million Satoshi's dice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's pretty interesting because uh, if you look at the devs, uh, if you look at the number of transactions, like 77% of all dev transactions are gambling related and then it's followed by games, like I guess NFT ah. related games and then like exchanges. So yeah. <laughs> What's the primary use cases of devs? Gambling. Yeah, so. I, I, I actually find it kind of interesting that uh, what Ethereum was saying in back in 2017 about Bitcoin's fee too high, too slow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now EOS, Tron, and others are doing it to Ethereum now, right? Like comparing it to like a number of transactions and DApps, etc. So I, I don't know. I find it kind of interesting. Hey, at least at least we're get we're actually getting to test uh, test drive a lot of these blockchains and see if they're lying or not about their scalability and their speed and stuff. True, true. Uh, this is just a small thing, but then um, so we actually I have a show with CoinDesk Korea where we try these DApps out and then we actually like you know figure out like whether they're good or bad. And the first three episodes we wanted to do it in Korea. We had wanted to do it about Korea. So the first step was. Uh, like a game called uh, Go Crypto Ball that was based out of Korea. But after that, we were just completely lost because according to Korean regulation, you are not allowed to do any gambling app in Korea. So every, every single dApp company that we contacted, everybody like limited IP, like Korean IP addresses. So we couldn't do any <laughs> shows with them. So that was kind of a bummer. It really goes to like prove the point that all the dApps are gambling dApps in one form or another. Yeah, but is it, is it a VPN or something? Call it a DAP if it's able to uh, IP block, right? No, no, like, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, you could IP block this, and then so it's not really a DAP. And then the th second thing is the reason we can't do the show is because Coindesk Korea is owned by like another like major media company in Korea. So even if we did use the VPN to get around it and we recorded the show, then the media company would get in big trouble, so we can't do it. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I, that's all for me from the report. I mean, that's, uh, we publish it. And if you're interested, you can take a look more on our website on CoinGecko. Uh, I think it's been a while. It's been over an hour since we started talking now, right? It's been about an hour and 20 minutes or so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hour and, yeah, a little bit. Don't worry about it. But uh, yeah, we should try to wrap it up. I, I don't know, Leo, is there any other things you wanted to say or that we didn't ask you? Um, no. Um, thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Sian. Thank you, Koji. Really awesome to be here. Cool. And uh, then, Sian, can you wrap it up? Because you are the 
obviously. You know? <laughs> yes, I'm I'm the silent host. Right. I do the <laughs> I do the intros and I do the outros. Next time I'll think of a like a really flashy yeah. tagline. Um, yeah. So um, thank you everyone on the internet and everybody, all the crypto lovers uh, out there. Um, we had a wonderful show. Thank you, Leo, so much for um, all the insights that you gave us about Hong Kong. It, like that, now we, I think we all understand it a lot better. So um, yeah, this was uh, Sian. Yeah, just if anyone interested in Hong Kong, just contact Leo. Yes. <laughs> yeah, write me anytime. Cool. All right. All right. Thank We're you. Gonna, Leo. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Okay, everyone. You. Have a see you next month or so. Hopefully. Yeah. See ya. Yeah. Bye.